well, thank you for the your way as well. Thank you for the chance to come and speak to you this afternoon. Um, what I'd like to talk about is the Roman Iron Age. What is the Roman Iron Age, you might ask? Um, well, it's a term we use to try to get away from the idea that you have the Iron Age and then the Romans turn up. Yes, the Romans may well turn up, but there is still an Iron Age going on. They don't come into an empty landscape. So using a term like Roman Iron Age is a way of trying to explore this period without purely a Roman focus. So that's, I suppose, the starting point. And while I will look slightly wider, I will start in the pre-Roman period, my main focus is going to be look, is looking at the development of society in Fife and slightly further afield in the first four centuries AD or so. Now, we've already heard about Hillforts, too much about Hillforts in my uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I shamelessly steal this slide from the Atlas to reiterate the point that struck me that the fight is not in that sense natural Hillforts territory. This is not a sort of area dominated by Hillforts in the same way as East Lothian is. And the reason for putting this up is to raise the question of where does fight sit in our wider view of Scotland? So in this context, Fife is fitting into a northern view, and that would also explain why we have much more open settlement. Open settlement is much more typical of the northeast of Scotland at this period. And I would agree with Strat's view that most of the hill forts are likely to be abandoned by the Roman Iron Age. The problem is we just don't know, and we don't know because people don't <coughs> dig enough in this area. This next site gives you an idea of the numbers of excavated sites throughout the first millennia BC AD. And up here we have the glamorous islands and the highlands and the romantic landscapes. Or you have places near Edinburgh, which is also a strong factor in where archaeologists choose to dig. And Fife languishes down here. And that's one of the real problems. We just haven't dug enough here to give a full story. And that, of course, also gives me the caveat that everything I say can be changed by future evidence. <laughs> <laughs> when you do dig, what do you find? Well, you dig one of these Hillford sites, and Iron Age finds are not in general glamorous. Um, the top two slides here are objects from Clapshot Craig. And the material from Iron Age excavations is rarely stuff of glamour. Much of it is the archaeology of the everyday, the pottery and the stone tools, if you're lucky, the bone implements, the pieces of shale bangle and so on. But these examples from Clapshot Craig are really interesting in their own right because they do allow us to start to weave a story of a wider world and the way these people are living. So on the left here is a gaming piece, immediately with implications of spare time. That you're not just spending your life toiling the soil, if you like. And on the right, the fragments of bangle and black shiny stone. Um, these, for Clatford Creek on the north coast of Fife, these would be imports. Because the map of sources, I mean, we often call this stuff jet, but it isn't jet. There's very little use of jet in Scotland at this period. Most of these things are local ver versions. It's the shales and the canal coals and the lignites. Well, where do you find these? You find them in the central coal field or in Ayrshire. So for the south coast of Fife, places like Weems Caves, they're local. For the north shore of Fife, they're not. And it implies contacts and connections. You're negotiating access to sources. You're bringing material in. So it's not just telling you about craft and appearance. It's telling you about contact. So even the most ordinary-looking scrap can, in the right hands, be used to tease out wider stories. You have to work quite hard with these kind of things. You don't have to work quite so hard with these kind of things. And of course, there is the glamour end of the Iron Age as well. And I show this to show you something of the quality of material that comes from Fife in the pre-Roman Iron Age. These date probably to around the 3rd or 2nd century BC, and they're a style of material known as a ribbon talk made from high quality gold, made by working it very careful hammering, very complicated hammering pattern to generate the spiral appearance of these things. And these styles of ribbon torque are a style shared across central and northern Scotland with the northern half of Ireland. So again, evidence of contacts and connections <coughs> in the centuries before the Romans turn up. 
And this is really giving us a picture of, a, of people who are connected. High craft skills, wide ranging connections. If we come into the archaeology of the Roman period, before we start looking at that, we should again look at local material. And we have this stuff that gets called Celtic art. Here, for example, from Seafield Tower near Kinghorn, this wonderful, massive bronze armour. This would have been worn on an upper arm. It may originally have had enamelled insets sitting in here. And this is a style of the first two centuries AD, which emerges beyond the Roman frontier, beyond the main edge of the Roman world. It is, if you like, a response against the Roman world, a reaction against the Roman world, showing that we're not Roman, we're not conquered. So in that sense, the Fife find looks north. It fits into this wider northeast Scottish pattern. But again, we pose the question of which way does Fife look in the Iron Age, because other finds look a different way. So the other main metalworking tradition in Scotland at this time is a style called boss style. Imaginative names we give these things because of the bosses that crop up in much of the metalwork. This map prepared a few years ago would really see the distribution stopping at the fourth with only a fringe of material heading north. But a couple of recent metal detecting finds show that this style of material is also coming into find. So the metalwork the Iron Age metal, the Celtic art, if you like, looks both north and south. And this becomes um, a recurring feature in the way we understand Fife through the course of the Iron Age. We can see it in other finds, not always glamorous looking things, this tiny little fragment from Balin Brich comes from one of these things. What's that, you might ask? It's a handle of one of those. So we go from the fragment to how the original would have looked and then fill in the missing bits and our tiny little bit of bronze becomes a tankard. And again, that's a distribution, that's an object with a much more southerly distribution. So the find from Ballenbrich is looking south. It's the objects coming in from the south. A connected area. So what happens when these gentlemen turn up on your doorstep? For those who can't read the caption at the back, it says, I expect you've heard about Roman roads. You can see the centurion's sneer on his face. And often when we look at the impact of the Roman world, we see it in purely in terms of m the military violence and inconvenience, the bother that it caused, the progress of conquest. Well, that's not really the only way of looking at it. And for Fife, it's also not the most relevant way of looking at it. There's two main Roman invasions of Scotland in the late 1st century and in the middle of the 2nd century, and both of them avoid Fife. <laughs> I'm not drawing any conclusions from that. <laughs> Where's the door? <laughs> but it's not the only area, because they also avoid East Lothian. And we have this area on the eastern seaboard, an area where we would expect to find Roman material if it was there because of the wealth of crop marks, where we simply don't see it. It's likely these are areas that are friendly towards the Roman world. And in fact, particularly in the second century, after they built the Antonine Wall, you build this fringe of forts to the north. And our main reason for doing this may well be to protect the breadbasket of Fife from the unpleasant Hades to the north. So it's your neighbours are causing the bother. <laughs> so what, how do we understand finds from Fife? Because we do get Roman material coming up in Fife, and in fact coming up in increasing quantities. I reviewed this in 1996, and there's only a thin scatter of material. I pulled the evidence again together last year, and it more than doubled. And it changes the way we can understand this Roman material coming into Fife. Now, what little of this, very little of this is coming, is being dropped from Roman hands. Much of this is Roman material coming into local hands. Not all of it. There's some curious finds from Boar Hills, which include a lead weight, a Roman lead weight. These are very rare finds of Iron Age sites, and they suggest instead some trading contacts round about, round about the mouth of the Eden. And another weird find is this fragment of a Roman roof tile from the Isle of May. Um, originally, what we have here is the flange 
of one of these things. It doesn't suggest a Roman building on the Isle of May. It's likely to be brought in later. And it's a reminder, if you like, of being careful in interpreting these stray finds. But most of the material we're dealing with is coming into Fife from the Roman world into local hands. And there's a very clear selection over what is being used. People are choosing things that are valuable to them. And in particular, they choose things they can use locally. We're not interested in roads and togas and aqueducts and these boring bits of Roman culture. They're interested in things they can show off with. Spectacular finds like these. And one of the problems we have as archaeologists, you'll see this with the East Lowland finds, is we deal in fragments. We deal in rubbish. So you mentally make the leap from these to those, and you begin to see the quality of material coming into local hands. So Roman objects can be very desirable, particularly for feasting and drinking. So much of this material is connected with the consumption of food and drink, ways of showing off, ways of showing you're somebody impressive. Or with jewellery, wearing a Roman brooch was a badge of status, a badge of connections. And again, make the leap from the small battered fragment to the big impressive brooch and you get a sense of how these things would once have looked. So in the 1st and 2nd centuries AD, this time when I would say Fife is a friendly zone, they're getting access to the pottery and the glass and the brooches which have been used to show off their, their links to the Roman world. But there's a change. And what I'd like to look at over the, last, the remainder of my talk is how things change over time, over the 400 years of Roman occupation. And there's a major change around the middle of the second century when the Romans abandon the Antonine Wall and pull back to Hadrian's Wall, a flood of silver comes north. And what you are looking at, ladies and gentlemen, is bribery and corruption, graft on the Roman frontier. This is stuff that's being used as payoffs. This is being used as gifts or bribes or subsidies to powerful locals. It's a way of securing the frontier without involving the armies. And if you look at the distribution of these hordes, you see quite a notable cluster from east central Scotland, south of the Forth, up, round, up the northeastern coast and up to the Murray Firth, targeted on the eastern seaboards. And this policy of payoff is something we see widely across Europe at the time. We sit here on a story that runs from the Atlantic to the Black Sea. At exactly this period, in the late second century, silver is being used to buy peace on the Roman frontier. Now one of the great things about coins is you can date them. You can tell when they're made, when they're minted. And because of that, we can look at how this pattern of payoffs changes over time. So when Scotland is still occupied in the Antonine Wall, there's a broad and thin scatter of coins. But let me just flick through the next few slides and watch the pattern of dots as things change through time. Concentration in the eastern seaboard, shift to the north, shift to the south. And what this is reflecting, in my view, is changing patterns of diplomacy. The Romans are targeting different areas at different times. Let me bring up a multicoloured slide showing all three patterns at once. Where is the area where they coincide? It's Eastern Fife. And it seems that this is the area, no matter how the politics changes, the people in Fife are seen as critical to maintaining peace on the frontier. And I suspect one of the reasons for that is because of their troublesome neighbours. We hear of the Maiatai and the Caledonians as the tribes who are causing bother on the northern frontier at this time. The Maiatai are likely to be around Stirling, the place names of Mayat Hill and Dunmayat. The Caledonians into Perth and Angus, preserved in the names of Dunkeld and Shehalian, the names still surviving. So in that sense, from the Roman point of view, the people in Fife are the front line. They are the key buffer between what's happening to the north and preserving the peace of the province to the south. And one of the ways that, that the Romans are dealing with this, of trying to keep Fife friendly, keep them on their side, is with these payoffs of silver. What uses the silver locally? 
because at this period there's no evidence of it being recycled. Instead, these are prestige goods, things you'd show off with, things you'd exchange, things you might use to hire mercenaries, to build alliances, to give as gifts to the gods. So one strand of this Roman policy is silver, the other strand does remain military might. Eventually things get so difficult on the northern frontier that the Emperor Severus, who you see here in full beard mode, comes back in in the early 3rd century. And at that stage we do see Roman incursions into fight. There's marching camps, Dr. Mahti and Edenwood, heading most likely um, up to the mouth of the Eden um, because much of the supplies for this campaign are coming in by sea. We also have in this, in this early, in this Sevierian campaign, evidence of the first Tay Bridge. This is a rare coin of Caracalla, which is most likely struck to commemorate the crossing of the Tay somewhere near Carpu. So, the twin prongs of silver diplomacy and military might. Initially, they try the silver diplomacy, then the Romans bring the military might in again. Then, we now realise they go back to diplomacy, but diplomacy of a different sort. And this is new information from new discoveries. One of the things I love about working in the museum is that every so often a picture like this pops into my inbox. And this came from a metal detecting rally in 2015 at Dersey. Found The first found was made by a 14-year-old schoolboy, David Hall. And they recovered what they could and then called up the treasure trove unit, who then got me involved to go to middle look at the site. The initial finds were made with the detectorists. We then went back out to excavate to see what we could discover about the setting of it. Because this is not a find spot we would otherwise have been drawn to. It's just another arable field. Nothing was known in the vicinity. So nothing would have led us to look at that site. What did we do? Well, we, st we stripped away topsoil, metal detecting as we went, working with the original finders, plotting the finds to discover where the concentration of the hoard was. But then the question was, why was it there? Why was this find sitting at Dersey? And this is where the skills of the archaeologists take over from the beeping of the metal detector. Because down at the base of the plough soil, cut into the natural subsoils, we started to see shapes. And as we dug the features, the, 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 the pits and things, some of them turned out to have things in them. In this case, the broken stub of a standing stone associated with prehistoric pottery. Something that was probably 2,000 years old already at the time this hoard was buried. <coughs> so we were able to show the hoard of Roman silver was placed not just in any old lump in the field, but between two standing stones on one side, an ancient monument at the time, and a peat bog on the other. Peat bogs are like the wishing wells of prehistory. You often see powerful objects, valuable objects, being placed into them as offerings to the gods. And this setting here suggests this hoard wasn't just hidden, it was deliberately put under the protection of the gods, a sacrifice, if you like. A pattern we see elsewhere in the area, you look at the eastern shores of Loch Leven, and there is a scatter of intact or largely intact Roman brooches around what would have been the muddy margins of the site before it was drained. These two are likely to be put there as offerings. Or another recent metal detecting find from Capel Dray in Fife, um, a silver finger ring with a gemstone showing the god Mars holding the um, a figurine of victory here. This led us to a 1924 local history account of a find of Roman jewellery being found 40 years earlier near the Deal's stain. Now, it was one of these accounts that had just been dismissed because the world is full of allegedly Roman jewellery, much like Strat showing us Andrew Small's alleged Roman forts. These early accounts are often full of nonsense. But this one wasn't. There was indeed a hoard of Roman jewellery, again, buried beside an ancient monument, buried by a standing stone. So this idea of placing things in older locations shows the power of them. What did we find? 408 fragments, smashed to bits by the plough. But hundreds of hours of conservation work have helped to piece them together. And we have bits of four vessels. 
a cylinder. Perhaps a failed casting, perhaps a blank um, that's been recycled, chucked in the scales rather than the melting pot. Two fragments of a dish about a foot and a half in diameter, cut in half, cut in half again, with two quarters of it then folded up into a package and buried. And the centre of the dish had this beautiful engraved and inlaid decoration. And it comes from a vessel something like this. Here's a parallel from northern France. Two fragments of a bowl. And you can get a hint here from this, the lines of how impressive this would have looked before it was cut to bits. It would have been something like this. Again, cut in half, cut down further and folded up into a package. Most battered of all, hundreds of fragments from a vessel whose quality is hard to realise now, but when you zoom in and see the detail, here a vase with piled high with grapes, vines growing out of it. Originally, this recurring pattern of roundels and vases and roundels and vases ran round the, the body of this vessel. And we think this was placed over the top of the hoard and then the plough has just scalped it. It would have looked something like these. These are all late 3rd century. So in the, in the century after the Roman invasion, the last Roman invasion, the century after the coin hoards, they start using this instead. Silver coming north. But silver, which has been cut to bits. This find is really important because the earliest find anywhere in Europe beyond the frontier to show us this use of silver at this period. But what does it mean? Why is the silver being cut up? Well, for a long time, the blame fell on barbarians. It was thought that no good Roman could ever chop up fine classical art, surely. And yet, the picture is more complicated. We don't need to blame the locals for this. When we start to look at the wider picture of this hack silver, as we call it, we discover it's a phenomenon both inside and outside the Roman frontier. We then discover so this is the frontier running along here. We then discover the hacking is really very careful. Vessels being cut into quarters or thirds. If this is being done by brutal barbarians, they're obsessive compulsive brutal barbarians <laughs> who also have a very fine grasp of the Roman economic system. Because in these two hordes here, these hacked bits of silver weigh exactly a pound. This group weighs exactly half a pound. And these give us the clues. This is material being cut up for use as bullion by the Romans inside the Roman world. This is silver being turned from object into a valuable weight, converted to bullion. So it is all to do with Roman economics. So what brings it north? Why does silver then stretch beyond the frontier? Well, this map is slightly misleading. This shows hack silver all across the empire in any quantity at all. When you look at hordes dominated by hack silver, these are much more a northern phenomenon. A weight of silver is being sent repeatedly beyond the northern frontier. <coughs> Why is that? <coughs> well, most likely it's because of threats on the frontier. The evil Picts, who you see commemorated in this dice tower here, saying the Picts are defeated, the host destroyed, let us play the game. <coughs> so one of the ways the Romans are dealing with threats on the frontier is by payoff. This is the equivalent, 100, 200 years later, of this um, silver coins. They're sending silver north to bolster the frontier. They're also hiring soldiers. They're hiring mercenaries. And some of this silver may well be coming north as military pay. And there's hints of that in another recent find from Fife, from Kincable near St Andrews. This fragment here is from one of these things. What's called a crossbow brooch, a symbol of late Roman official service, often military service, often high-ranking. Here we see um, the general Stilicho, the man who was effectively running the Roman Empire at the end of the 5th century, wearing exactly such a brooch. So this suggests people with direct links in to the late Roman world are coming back to find. 
And we can see the general spread of late Roman finds in the area, and particularly the two great hacks of the horse, Dersey and from Capraim, which Strat kindly showed earlier, as being connected with buffering against the emerging Picts, at least in this area here, arguably further north as well. But where are these finds coming to? Who are the people of late Iron Age Fife? Well, you're looking yourselves at East Lowen, which is clearly a critical site. The other one is Clatchard Craig, which has been mentioned already. Not a site you can easily go back to, because it's now a massive quarry. And this really is a tragedy, <coughs> because the little um, trial trenching effect of it that was done in Clatchard Craig gives a sense of a site of fundamental importance to understanding this period. And I took the chances to fish out a couple of the finds from the site to show you effectively what we've lost. This decorated fitting here, this mount, it looks like the swirls and spirals of Celtic art. It's actually coming from the Roman frontier. This is the kind of thing you see in military fittings all around the edge of the empire, from Britain to Germany and as far as Syria, travelling on the trap of soldiers. Dating to the late 2nd and early 3rd centuries AD, the period of the coin hoards, it shows that Clatcher Craig was a centre at that period already. A small scabby piece of pottery, but an important piece of pottery, because this is late Roman. Oxfordshire red slip, where glamorous names these things get, which is probably the same as some of the shelves coming from East Lomond Hill, a rare late Roman import. And then again, like East Lomond, you have early medieval imports. Eware, so-called, these imported vessels, and the glass coming from vessels, something like this, and these rare east coast dots um, of what's essentially a west coast connection. Showing, as Oliver said, the diplomatic connections and the importance of people in this area. So Clatcher Craig and East Lowland, in a sense, are, look to be similar kinds of sites, only one of them is entirely gone, one of them we've lost the story of. One of the finds we didn't lose, though, was this thing. Recovered from the excavations was a silver ingot. And this allows me to bring the story back to silver. Because what's happening with all this hack silver, this Roman hack silver coming north, it's being chucked in the melting pot. It's being recycled and turned into local prestige items. Small scale things, finger rings, pins, things that are catching the eye, if you like, but also large scale items. These massive silver chains represent conspicuous consumption of Roman silver. The largest weighs almost three kilograms. Often called Pictish because of the symbols on them. This is really a misleading term at this time. We don't know what a Pict looks like at this period. But the distribution of them misses the main area of, develop, of emerging Pictland, if you like. You see it in the south of Scotland. You see it in northern Pictland, so-called north of the mouth. Again, a gap in this area here. And interestingly, so far, none of these coming from Fife. So there's a challenge for you when you're out walking your dog. Keep your eye open for big heavy chains. <laughs> but it shows the way this silver is being used at this period. That's all very well and good as long as the silver keeps flowing north. What do you do when the Western Empire collapses? What do you do when you suddenly don't have the flow of silver north again? You start recycling it. We see local hack silver and a hoard like Norrie's Law um, from, the, from, the, from near Largo, southern shores of the peninsula. Um, much of it now lost, but this shows the hacking and recycling process in the, in the 5th century. So Roman silver being nurtured on so you can keep making these prestige goods. Now the hoard is well known for its a small number of glamorous items, but actually it's the small fragments that help to tell the story. Because among these tiny wee fragments are bits of Roman silver. This from a late Roman spoon. From the early record of the find, much of it now lost, unfortunately, late Roman coins. And analysis has shown there's other bits of characteristically late Roman silver in this find. So we see here the late Roman silver acting as a husbanded resource, which becomes a power tool in the early medieval period. You want to show off in the early medieval period, you need to have silver. The Roman silver, the legacy of Rome, is critical in showing your power. I hope that's given you some sense of what these 
often stray finds, these casual finds, can tell us if we look more carefully at them and if we follow them up in the field. It's really important to try to give a context to these things. Don't just trust me, come and see the finds yourself. We have an <laughs> exhibition on at the moment till the end of February on exactly this topic, Scotland's early silver. If you can't make it to Edinburgh, at least buy the book. Thank you very much. <laughs>